Good morning and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church here in Baraboo. Myself, Pastor Lisa Newberry, our pianist, Joni Cross, and our soloist, Carrie Olson, are thrilled to be sharing worship with you here this morning. I have a couple of announcements before we get going. Uh, next week will be the first Sunday of the month, and so in addition to our parking lot communion, we will also be having virtual communion right here in worship. So I would invite you to have ready some form of juice and some form of bread if you are watching at home so that we can participate together in the holy meal. I also have been asked to announce that our stewardship season is underway. It will look a little bit different this year, of course, but please be watching Grace Notes and the mail. You will still be receiving lots of great information uh, about how you can continue to support the church. Truly, we thank you for all your support this year. You have kept us together as the body of Christ, even as we have been separate. I know we, we don't know what next year holds, but uh, we do know that we will continue to be salt and light in this community, however we are called, and we will do it together. On that note, let us begin our time in prayer. Well, gracious God, truly, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you, this time together, these moments of peace and quiet and intention when we ask that you would clear from our hearts and minds anything that distracts us from hearing the good news, cleanse us of any concerns we've had over the last week, and prepare us to hear your word, to feel your love, and to follow closely in the footsteps of your Son, Jesus Christ. All this we pray in his name. Amen. Well, for the past few weeks, we have been talking about Jesus' parables, and today we move on from that topic to the topic of promises. I guess this summer is brought to us by the letter P. So today, as we talk about God's promises, I will incorporate the scripture readings into the sermon. So let's ready our hearts and minds to hear God's word. So promises promises. To talk about this, first we need to consider what they really are. The dictionary states that a promise is a declaration, that something will or will not be done or given. The second definition is that a promise is an express assurance 
on which expectation is based. So I promise to pick up my kids from school. I promise I will pay you $25 if you take care of those children while my husband and I go out. Promises. Words that should be so strong we can make our plans based on them, make our expectations from them, make our futures based on those promises. But as we all know, probably, we don't hold all promises with the same seriousness, right? We all know that person who is going to pay us back next Tuesday, this time for real, or who's going to look into this or show up there, call them, and it just never quite works out. With these situations, promises we can't trust fully, we might feel a sense of anxiety or confusion or even exasperation as we seek to maneuver our lives around these words that may or may not come to fruition. Now, I don't know about you, but my life is easier when people keep their word and when I keep my word. Everything is in order and is much more secure. Imagine then the immeasurable security that we can find in God's promises, words which can never be broken, like those made to Abraham and Sarah about having descendants as numerous as the stars. It seemed impossible that this promise could ever be kept to the human mind. Still, in the book of Hebrews, we are reminded that when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, God confirmed it with an oath. This is gospel good news for all of us. We serve a God who keeps God's word. And so we can always, always trust in those words. So for the next few weeks, I'd like to read through and remind and renew our trust in God's promises for us. They are for each of us. They are for this day, and they are for always. So let's begin with a very beautiful promise, that of forgiveness. It's one that we as Presbyterians participate in every week in church through our time of confession, our prayer of confession. But I wonder if we ever really stop to consider the true meaning and the true value of these words. In 1 John 1, 9, we read, If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I suspect... We all know what it's like to have a guilty conscience, right? Each of us has done things we're not proud of, said things we regret. Sometimes we're caught, sometimes we're not. But the mental broken records and that sick feeling in our tummies can last regardless. Think of a time when you have felt guilty really Bring that time to mind and feel that feeling in your body for a moment. Can you feel it? Can you imagine living that way? We don't have to. Each week we confess our sins and remind ourselves that God's forgiveness for us is real. It is such good news. Whatever eats at you, whatever bothers you, whatever you regret, it is gone whenever you ask. Truly gone. 
The promise is for you and it is real. We don't have to carry guilt around. Jesus died for all of us, for all our shortcomings. They are washed away and we are freed to move forward. What a glorious promise of God. In fact, many of God's promises for us involve making our lives joyful and vibrant and full of hope and meaning. In Isaiah, in, <laughs> in Isaiah 40, 31, we read, But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And in Psalm 9, we read, The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. God is our strength and our power. God is more invigorating than that third cup of coffee, more energizing than that bunny beating a drum, more secure than Fort Knox, more certain than death and taxes combined. Now, I have the blessing of being a pastor and hearing stories from people of all ages and in all sorts of different places and phases in life and different situations, and I have seen this promise lived out time and time again. Now, renewed strength might look different at different points in life. Running and not growing weary might feel different in different situations. But when the faithful have called on God, this promise always proves true. Suddenly, we have strength endurance, hope, we didn't think we had. We can take one more step, wake up to one more day, face one more obstacle, all because of God's promise for us. In Jeremiah 29, 11, we read, For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm to give you a future with hope. A church friend and I were just talking about different plans that had at one time seemed halted in our lives, but then we realized they had just been answered in different ways than we had expected or anticipated, and even they had come true when sometimes we hadn't been all that helpful with their change in course. We talked about how you can't ever, ever stop God's plans. You can throw monkey wrench after human monkey wrench into the potential timing some days, but what God intends can never be thwarted. And what God intends are good things, a purpose, a plan, this is a promise for us as individuals, as a church family, as a community, and beyond. And God's purpose will always find a way. This ever-expanding understanding of promises leads us to the idea of communal promises. And God has made very special promises to the faithful, to the church. In James 5, we read, Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. This is huge. Now, we all know that both sickness and healing come in many different forms. But scripture is clear that there is a special healing gift in the church community. Our prayers for one another, they matter. They make a difference. They change things. 
They can usher in health or wholeness or forgiveness or peace. We can be raised up, sometimes in body, sometimes in spirit, through calling upon the Lord. Friends, this promise is true. We all know the power of prayer, the power of a call, or a card, or a casserole from a church friend, the faith, the love, the history, the grace that that person brings with them in that moment. It is powerful. It is beyond the gift of one person to another. It matters. It heals in ways we had not anticipated. And perhaps it leads us to heal pieces of ourselves that we didn't even realize were broken. This promise is true for each of us through the fellowship of believers. We can offer each other gifts of healing and forgiveness and love. So let's do that. Because we live in a world that is in need of healing and forgiveness and love. Our next promise also stands true for both individual believers and for the community of believers. It's recorded in Hebrews 2.18 and it says, Because he himself was tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. Temptation. Who among us has ever faced temptation? Maybe I should ask who hasn't. How did you face it? With only your own strength and endurance or with the love and support of others around you? Scripture teaches us that Jesus was tempted, as we are, and therefore Jesus is able to help us to be strong and to be wise and to be discerning in times of temptation. God did not send a Savior that didn't understand humanity. Instead, Jesus took on flesh and endured the hardships of life that we endure. Because of this intimate understanding, whenever we are tempted, we are not alone. We can always call on Christ to give us wisdom and power and direction and friends to stand beside us and strength to well up inside of us. In all of life's decisions, we have an advocate Never forget that this promise is true and call on Christ in moments of temptation. Finally, we come to the promise perhaps we most commonly hear about in church, the promise of eternal life. And there are so many passages about this promise, but in John 11 we read, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? We profess this promise to be true. That because of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the promises of God do not end when our life does. They do not end at the end of our earthly journey, but they continue into eternity, an eternity that we share in the presence of God, in the presence of holy love. This promise is true. And because of that, we have comfort as we entrust others into that place of God's eternal, holy love. And because of this, we are free to live fully, believing in God to guide us each day and to guide us in to God's home when it is time. So today we have shared together just some of the promises of God that are true for each of us, 
the promise of forgiveness, of strength, energy, protection, purpose, healing, and eternal life. Our lives are better when we remember and draw on and believe these words. So let's do that this week. And let's see what God does in return. Amen. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, brothers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, fathers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, mothers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sinners, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sinners, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear that starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Because we believe in God's promises, we believe in the power of prayer. We take time each week to lift up our joys and concerns, and we believe God hears and God answers. So let's bow our heads in prayer today. Gracious God, we believe that you are with us. We believe that you desire good things for us and for our world. We believe that you offer the gifts of hope and faith and love, of healing and strength and forgiveness and eternal life. As we think on these promises, we take a moment in silence in our own hearts to remember a promise that you have answered for us and to give thanks. Hear us in this moment of silence. Gracious God, we know that the litany of the concerns of our broken and fallen world are long and dark and heavy. At all levels, we face sickness and fear, poverty and violence, injustice, hunger, insecurity, and Lord, we dare to entrust all these things to you because we know that you are already at work answering prayer. We also come before you today because we believe that we each 
are one very small part of the answer to someone's prayer. And that when we each do our very small part, suddenly your light is made manifest in us, in our family, in our church, in our community. And so that is what we pray for, Lord, to know our one small part and to respond and to do it and to trust that it is enough, to trust that there are others to do other things and to trust that your love for us will carry us through our weeks We'll find where we should be and that together we will indeed help your kingdom come. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, as we leave this time of worship and head out into our weeks, I remind you that even as we go our own separate ways, We are never truly separated. We are one in the family of God. So brothers and sisters, know that you are not alone. You go with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the redeeming love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit now and always. May God bless and keep each of us until we are gathered together again. Amen.